Hi, I'm Vince Molinari and welcome to the Digital Asset Report. We have Baxter Hines with us today, who is the Chief Investment Officer at the newly formed, or in 2020, I should say at least, Honeycomb Digital Investments. Welcome, Baxter. Thanks so much, Vince. Great to be here. Well, listen, a terrific conversation coming up, I am certain. So you, you are traditional from the standpoint of a certified uh, financial analyst and uh, Chief Investment Officer of, I'd say, a newly formed, cutting edge, digital asset uh, focused firm. And uh, you're kind of melding both of those historic and new day together. Tell us a little bit about Honeycomb. That's exactly right. We think that there are many, many years of growth ahead for the digital asset space. There's incredible investor demand for these kinds of products as investors are looking to diversify in light of COVID-19 or just you know trying to make their portfolio is more efficient. It's a, it's a great way to differentiate. And so, yes, I come from the traditional asset management background. I worked as a portfolio manager for a firm called NFJ Investment Group. We were a wholly owned subsidiary of Allianz Global Investors. I was one of six of the portfolio managers overseeing about $40 billion for several years of pension money, mutual fund money. Uh, our mandate was to generate income for investors. And I really got into crypto about three or four years ago. And I really realized uh, when innovative products like Tether came around where you could take a dollar and put it on the blockchain and create this better, faster, cheaper way of moving money around, I realized you can do that for anything. If you can do it with, with a dollar, you can put it uh, uh, mutual funds on the, on the blockchain. You can do all kinds of new debt, all kinds of new security instruments. And again, shave a lot of costs and frictions out of doing business. And so I, I knew there was a huge opportunity there. And so that's why I formed Honeycomb Digital Investments to help investors get access to this space. And we are a little bit different in that we are trying to help our investors derive income from these blockchain-based assets. So in a world where there's this huge demand for new products, uncorrelated assets, and yield in a time of low interest rates, we think we've got a really great product to offer to the investment community. Well, talk about multiple... Uh, paradigm shifts, you know, as you say, low interest rate environments in many parts of the world, we have negative interest rates. You're talking about this ability to really monetize or create revenue income streams out of uh, instruments perhaps that were typically not available. And now you can digitize them, put them on the blockchain as, as you talk about. Give us a little, uh, I, I guess, view into your thinking, Baxter, when you look at you know, $40 billion of AUM in a traditional framework, it's got to be something so compelling here to draw you to this world of blockchain disruption or perhaps evolution of financial services. What, what do you see as the big picture? Yeah, I think big picture in, in my industry and in the traditional money management world, investors continue to go passive for two reasons. Number one, the market continued to be dominated by big companies like Google and Amazon that were really sort of driving the indices and investors wanted to take costs out of the system. Uh, they didn't want to deal with all the, the headaches of finding a, an active manager. They wanted to go passive for, for several reasons. And you know, from an asset allocation standpoint, a lot of the people who were uh, fiduciaries over that money, they totally bought into that type of process. Now what's happened is so many people have done that at this point that it's hard to differentiate uh, one financial offering from another. Everybody's kind of got the same thing. Maybe it's an S and P, uh, index, or maybe it's a, a bond index, whatever it might be. And as I mentioned earlier, there are larger and larger weightings in, in overall portfolios towards alternatives, but those assets are very difficult to get. So what I liked about blockchain, and I liked about this new delivery mechanism is that you could put all anything of value, whether it was you know a piece of artwork, whether it was a private equity fund, whether it was uh, a small cap company that wasn't publicly traded, you could put that on the blockchain and the blockchain was an incredible means to transfer value and information. And both of those things are going to lead to incredible efficiencies in the market, as well as the option for liquidity that a lot of these assets that are going to come on the blockchain didn't have before. And so investors are going to be able to acquire assets that they couldn't get, get in prior years, and they're going to be able to, to trade them. And so a lot of people just wouldn't invest in some of these asset classes before because out of their cash flow needs wouldn't allow them to be locked up in an investment for a, a huge amount of time. 
or because maybe their just investment policy standards wouldn't allow them to do it. I think blockchain is going to revolutionize the financial space in that way by just opening up all kinds of new investments to new types of investors. So we're talking about levels of cost savings in the efficiency with the technology, access to new product, liquidity, seems like it has it all. So you know, how, do, how do you move to tokenization or digitization of these securities? What, what's the next step? So I would say that the first thing that is changing at just warp speed and is incredibly exciting is that the infrastructure is getting built to deliver these products in a fully compliant way to retail and institutional investors. If we had been having this conversation 18 months ago, you couldn't even custody something like Bitcoin. Uh, it, the, the mechanisms didn't exist. The legal frameworks weren't there. Uh, big players in the industry were scared to death of uh, really even just associating with that type of an asset. You've got huge, well-known names like Fidelity's in the custody business. You've got uh, DBS in Southeast Asia, Nomura, one of the largest banks in Japan as a custody outfit. And those are just a few names that, that I, I could throw out. I could, I could mention many, many more. So infrastructure is getting there from the custody side, trading. Uh, all the investment banks now have a, a head of digital assets and a, huge, a whole division dedicated to them where they have someone at the managing director level who's overseeing the, the, the growth and development of that space within their firm. So companies like Credit Suisse, UBS, Morgan Stanley, uh, the, the, the major players on Wall Street are aware of the potential of this sect space and they're, and they're getting, getting more and more involved. So as in, infrastructure is there, that leads the, to uh, a lot of more confidence in what is being sold and makes investors more comfortable getting access to these kinds of, of instruments. So I think that's the first step that's, that's being taken. We're seeing a, 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 a gradual yet very sudden uh, inflection in terms of uh, the adoption and in terms of the ability to, to make this really happen. So that, that's, that to me is what's exciting is that we're at this sort of tipping point where more and more people are getting involved. Yeah, and I, I think back to your 100% right. And if you overlay that to the major law firms all having, you know, uh, crypto digital departments, uh, many of the professional service firms across CPAs, auditing firms beginning to think about this. And I think uh, more clarity and comfort with the regulators are, are what are going to, as you pointed out, custody, right? Being that holy grail that I think that's been holding up the space a bit. So uh, I, think it, I, I think there is a holistic, uh, greater level of comfort in understanding the technology and how it applies. Exactly. They're, we're getting the, the wrapper, so to speak, this, this digital wrapper together in a way that everybody's comfortable with. And there are several innovative projects and sort of pioneers or first movers in the space that have put out good, good investment offerings and are proving that this technology works. And so there's an old saying that you know, nobody wants to be first to a party, but nobody wants to be last. Well, we've got sort of the first people to the party. And there are a lot of, of others on the sidelines that are watching and are saying, if you know, Nobody gets bogged down in the courts. Nobody gets into trouble with the regulator. And, you know, the investors make a good return off these investments. Yeah, I think I'm going to going to come in pretty soon and, and start packaging my product this way as well. So it's uh, it, it's really in the, we're in the early stages of many, many years of growth. And, and that's that to me is, is what we're seeing unfold. Okay. Well, talk about coming to the party. Uh, I know you have a new book out that's encapsulating so much of this wisdom and thought. Uh, Digital Finance, Security Tokens, and Unlocking the Real Potential of Blockchain. Just out, and that was John Wiley and Sons. Tell us about the book. I, I believe it's being received extraordinarily well, so congratulations on that. Thanks so much. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we're getting at the top of a lot of, of the Amazon categories in terms of being a, a bestseller or a number one new release, so lots of reception. I see that as a, as a really strong sign from the financial community and, and the people who are interested in this type of a subject matter. The fact that the, the book is selling well tells me that you know something big is about to unfold here. The book is really about getting investors comfortable with the space. It's talking about how blockchain is going to disrupt the financial industry, but more importantly, and, and more of the, of the subject matter is devoted to these new assets that are gonna be available to investors. So a little bit on crypto, we talk about digital lending and uh, digital currencies, uh, again, like a dollar or a yen or a euro being put onto the blockchain. And then the bulk of the material is about the tokenization of securities, 
putting real assets onto the blockchain. So a token is just simply a digital representation of real world ownership of a real world asset. And so uh, we think that's gonna, gonna grow. The point of the book was to not get technical onto this in this subject matter. I focus more on the benefits and what people can do with the technology and, and how it will impact their jobs, impact their, their livelihood and, and better their way of, of forming wealth through their investments. Um, you know, I've, I've heard someone say, you know, you don't have to understand how an internal combustion engine works to drive a car. You just need to know how to get in, turn the keys and know, you know, how to, how to turn the steering wheel. Same thing with blockchain. You don't have to know all the, the ins and outs. You just need to know that it's a safe technology and know what it's used for. And so I, I really, again, wanted to focus on those benefits and make the material relatable to uh, the readers by including things like case studies, historical perspectives, and industry trends so that they could see how this new uh, digital uh, journey that we're going on is unfolding. Great. Well, Baxter, thank you so much for joining us today. Look forward to everybody checking out your new book and uh, good luck on the new journey. Really appreciate you taking uh, time to, to talk with me today. Thanks, Vince. My pleasure.